It can happen anywhere, and it does, usually in the same way. Moist, warm air from the south overruns cold air from the north. The warm air is forced aloft, and a thunderstorm forms. Rain begins falling beneath the northeastern part of the storm, and then large hail, a tip-off of something far worse. At the southwest edge of the storm, almost always at that place, a dark, low-hanging cloud begins to churn. Out of it suddenly comes something frightening, a tornado funnel. Abruptly it touches down, spinning at more than 200 miles an hour, moving, growing, scooping up debris. Sometimes there is one funnel, sometimes several. Sometimes funnels are obscured by rain or darkness. Tornadoes may appear as transparent dust clouds, thin gray ropes, or black, wide-mouthed monsters. Whatever their shape, tornadoes grind across the nation year after year, bringing terror, death, and destruction. Since 1950, NOAA records show tornadoes have struck every state in the Union, killing thousands and injuring more than 100,000. But far fewer die or are injured when people are prepared. Most of them were ready when one of the biggest tornadoes ever seen struck Wichita Falls, Texas. It was an April afternoon, the one they call Terrible Tuesday. We'd had tornado warnings all afternoon, and we were headed to the mall, and we just did not think that a tornado was going to hit where we were. Mona Partham and her husband were caught in the open by the tornado and survived, but just barely. They abandoned their car near a church and tried to cling to a tree. I remember spinning around the tree, and the next thing I know, I, we were sitting up on the curb. A gentleman at a pickup passed us, and I happened to raise my hand up. And he stopped, and he and another gentleman from the ravine helped us into the pickup, took us to the hospital, where they amputated my right leg below the knee. A couple of weeks later, I was flown to a Dallas hospital, where they amputated my left leg above the knee. James Montgomery was luckier. I got up to speeds of 70 to 75 miles an hour in my station wagon, and as I crested the hill, I realized that the tornado was still immediately behind me and I was not gaining any distance at all. Realizing that I could not outrun it, I started looking for some type of protection, either the culvert or about that time I thought of the wedge shape up underneath the overpass as a possible source of protection. We ran to the paved area underneath the overpass and started running up toward the wedge and by that time the wind was so strong that I just spread eagle on the concrete to create the lowest profile. I immediately looked out from under the overpass and saw the National Guard Armory completely disintegrate. And when the winds finally subsided, all the cars that had pulled in and parked under the overpass had been blown and were stacked up on one another and I started looking for my automobile and I found it a quarter of a mile down the expressway in this condition. Norma Wright walked outside her gift shop just as the tornado struck. She grabbed a construction scaffold and hung on. Suddenly the wind was not a wind anymore. It was a very solid force. I heard the sound of my voice as the air was pulled from my lungs. Um, the sensations were of being pounded and hit and stabbed. It was violent. It was very, very violent. And my intention at that time was not so much to live as it was to be able to endure whatever I had to endure until the end, whatever 
that was going to be. But I guess instinctively I held on to the base of that scaffolding. Um, injuries were severe. All four limbs were severely injured. Um, my left leg was off just below the knee. Uh, my right arm was torn uh, from elbow to wrist. My left arm was broken. And my right leg was both uh, broken in several places and lacerated to the bone from knee to ankle. Isla Benson and six other employees of her bank rode out the tornado in the bank's reinforced steel and concrete vault. This was the bank. They had sounded the tornado sirens that afternoon, but we really didn't pay any attention to them until I made a call home to my son, and he said, Mom, there is a bad storm coming, so please take cover. So seven of us employees went into the vault, and we knelt on the floor, and we could hear this roaring sound. And then all of a sudden, we just felt like we was going to explode and our ears needed popping. So we stayed there for a while till everything got quiet. And then we got up and we looked out and we just couldn't believe what we saw because there the cars that were in the parking lot were now in the bank's lobby and there was no bank left. Forty-six people died in Wichita Falls that Tuesday. It was a very small number considering the path a mile and a half wide that the tornado cut through the town. Yet many died unnecessarily. About half were killed because they tried to escape in cars and trucks, one of the very worst things they could have done. Most of the people of Wichita Falls know better. Their city has an outstanding disaster plan. Mark Wilson is the director. The city annually conducts a disaster exercise involving all of the city departments and divisions as well as the total medical community. Uh, we have found over the years uh, that the disaster drill uh, has greatly enhanced our capability of dealing with a disaster. Uh, many researchers came into our city following the, uh, the disaster and without exception each one of those uh, researchers uh, concluded that uh, we should have had perhaps as many as 2,000 fatalities 